Amen. Jonah chapter 3, a famous passage where we see Jonah hearkening unto the voice of the Lord. Jonah was sent to Nineveh, and we know the story where he ran from God, or he thought he could. Uh, ends up getting cast out, swallowed by a whale, spit up on shore. Here he comes, and here's the message he brings. Look at Jonah chapter 3, verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days in Nineveh shall be overthrown. We see the message that's given to us in the book of Jonah is that he warns them of 40 days, and it's all over. Now, we're told in the New Testament that there were those that got saved. So, obviously, this is just a glimpse of the message. He was preaching the gospel. He was preaching judgment. Here he says, yet 40 days, and the fruit of that immediately, they believed God. They uh, had faith in the Lord. Then they proclaim a fast. They humbled themselves, and then the king himself begins to preach and proclaim these truths. And as a nation, they prayed. They cried unto God. They asked for help. They repented of their works. They turned to God. What an amazing story all wrapped up in a short passage here. But I do want to focus on this phrase in verse number 4. This is a prophecy from God at the mouth of Jonah. And he says, And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Yet forty days, and it's all over. In forty days, the end is coming. And this was that message. God's prophecy through Jonah to Nineveh was that the end was nigh. You've got forty days left. You say, well, that was God's message through Jonah. What's God's message through you, Pastor Fannin? I'll tell you my prophecy. In forty days, it's all over. You only have 40 days left. There are only 40 days, and then the end will arrive. Today is the 325th day of the year 2021. You have 40 days left in this year. You only have 40 days to do the things that you want to do in 2021, and then it's all over. That's it. No more 2021. Now, I will tell you, there were things in 2020, I had plans for 2020, let me tell you. I had a vision for 2020, I had goals for 2020. Oh man, did I miss the mark on some of those goals. How unfortunate. I want to compel you, to encourage you to use the 40 days that you have left to live for the Lord. I say, let's set our heart on the things of the Lord for these last 40 days. Let's not wait till the end of the year. Let's not wait for a new year. I want you to wake up in the morning. I want you to start tomorrow, Monday morning, with this thought in your mind, yet 40 days, and 2021 is over. When somebody 10 years from now says, what did you do in 2021? We say, we know I had a lot that I wanted to get done, but there were so many things I just couldn't do. If you could finish 2021 the right way, what would it look like? What would it sound like? If you could write your own story, which you are, and you could write 2020 the way that you wanted it to be written, what would you finish before the end? Or perhaps I should say, what would you start in these last 40 days so that you can guarantee the next 365 days will be better? What would you like to accomplish in the next 40 days? I want you to think about that. I want you to meditate on that. If you would, please go to Psalm chapter 90. Go to Psalm chapter number 90. I believe... God's will for your life is that you would get a personal vision for your time. Time isn't everything, right? Uh, well, unfortunately, it is on earth. Once you're done here, that's it. There's no going back. When you get to heaven, when you step into eternity, there's no going back. There's no finishing the started projects. It's so important to get a hold of our time and being good stewards. Now, listen, we should be good stewards over our family, and we should be good stewards over our money. But what are you doing with your time? I heard a saying recently, and I don't even remember where I heard it. I made it the, the background on my phone, so I see it every day. It says, time is the stuff that life is made of. Don't waste it. Boy, that's so important. 
You only have a little bit of time to do things for the Lord. You and your mind know you ought to know what the Lord wants you to do with your time. What are you really doing with your time? What are you accomplishing? What are you finishing? You've got 40 days left in 2021. Whether you like it or not, 2020 is coming. It could be better. It could be worse. It could be both. It could be just about the same as what we've had. We don't really know. I want you to look at Psalm 90. This is a great passage. Look at verse number 4. Psalm 90. Look at verse number 4. For a thousand years in thy sight are as but yesterday, when it is past, and as a watch in the night. In God's eyes, a thousand years. He's saying it's nothing. It's like yesterday. Now, how many, just to show of hands, how many of you had something you wanted to get done yesterday that you failed to get done? Large or small? I, I really had one thing I wanted to do. There was that one little thing. I had hoped to do this with my time yesterday, and I didn't quite get it done. Oops. Yesterday got away from me. Well, are you going to work on it tomorrow? Did you have to do it today? I say this because I want you to consider that when we look at yesterday, God says, yeah, I've been planning this for a thousand years. God, I want you to know this, God is a goal setter. You read Genesis chapter 1, and God said, let's make, and then God made, all right? God said, here's the goal, and here's what we're going to do, and he accomplished it. All throughout time, God has told us what the end will be like. God will finish his goals. He will finish his course. Now, we have been given a race as a Christian. We know what we ought to do, but the problem is we have these things that weigh us down. While you're in Psalm 90, I want you to look at verse number 9. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. He says, you know, look, we only get like 70 years on the earth. Perhaps if you're a strong man, if you obeyed your parents and you eat well and you treat your body well, then maybe you'll get 80 years on this life. Our friend, Brother Mike, that just passed. He made it in between there, 72, 73, right? He, only, he, he made it to this mark, but he didn't quite make it as far as could have been made. If he were to come back and talk to us tonight, and we gave him the pulpit, it'd be supernatural, it'd be a little scary, but I'm sure that he would tell us the time that he spent on earth, he had regrets, he had things that he had wished, he had spent more time on the things of the Lord instead of the things of the flesh. With God, it's like a thousand years. That was yesterday. He says, with you, your whole life, your whole span, it's like a little tale that was told. Remember that little story that somebody told you? That's your life. It's just a, it's a vapor. It will vanish, right? Look at verse 12. So what do we do? He says, so teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. God's goal for you is to number your days, to set a goal, to have a purpose, to have a vision, to know where you've come from and what to learn from that, but to know where you're going and, and figure out what it's going to take to get there, to count the cost. Do you have the gas? Do you know what it's going to take? What are you going to have to sacrifice? How far do you have to go? I look back, I can count over 40 years I've been alive. But what am I going to do for the next 40 days? Are you willing to get out a blank sheet of paper in the morning and start writing? One, two, three. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Are you willing to look at a calendar and say, this is what I would like to do for this day, and yay, in a week from today, I'd like to do this also, and yay, in a month and 40 days from now, here's what I want to do with my life, and I want to do it submitting to the will of the Lord. Are you willing to do this? Because I believe that God's purpose for us. I believe that we should have goals in life. And too many times we don't. There are many areas of our life that we can set goals. Individual goals is kind of where it starts because it's all in here, it's in here, and, and it has to work itself out in every area of your life. Spiritual goals, spiritual individual goals are the number one thing. Some of you are, are, are becoming soul winners with a desire to say, I help the Lord win a soul. I open my mouth. Some of us have that goal, right? Others say, well, I'm, I'm winning souls and I have a certain number. And hey, some f bring forth fruit 30 and 60 and 100 and say, well, I, I wanted to be one of those bigger numbers, but I'm the smaller number this year. What can I do in 40 days? 
Perhaps your spiritual goals deal with study time, prayer time. Do you have a prayer list? Do you, do you have a prayer list? Do you have a piece of paper with people's names and their needs on it that you look at and you pray for? I hope so. There's a lot I have up here that really should get written down so that when I come to the Lord, I can focus and say, yeah, I forgot about that person. Thank God I wrote it down so I can set a goal to pray for somebody else's need. Or even, even to pray for your own needs, I think it's very important. Do you have personal study time? Individual spiritual goals are the most important thing you can do. And if you're not being able to dedicate any of your day to the Lord, it, like I said, start your day with Proverbs and go from there. Get that habit. Get that repetition. And then, you know what? Hey, while I'm at it, let's read a psalm. Let's uh, pick up in John. Hey, the new year's coming, and I am going to provoke the church to read all the way through the New Testament like we've done in the past. We did it last year for uh, the reward of a Bible. I have something different this year, but we're going to do it again. We're going to do it again. And I thank God for all the, all the, the young adults that participated in that and had great victory in accomplishing something for the first time. I want to see it happen again. Let's move forward. Let's take that momentum and keep moving forward. We should all have goals for salvation, and some of us have not gotten anybody saved perhaps even some of the adults. And you say, well, I, I struggle with the gospel. It's hard for me. And I want you to understand, getting somebody saved is hard work. Think about this. The person that gets saved, they don't have to do any works. The works that are necessary for salvation, Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross, and now he's given you a task to go and do the work and open your mouth. It takes works on my part to get somebody else saved. You ever think about that? We put in the work so somebody else can receive the gift. God has called us to be laborers for His glory. We have spiritual goals. That's very important. I think we should have physical goals. And I'm not talking about the uh, pie fellowship coming up. We're not talking about increasing physically, okay? Not seeing how much we can eat. I think we should have physical goals to have better health or maintain our health or to find issues that are going on and do the best that we can. I think we should also have mental goals. I think as an individual, you should have mental goals. I think you should read other books outside of the Bible for your own mental good. I believe that you should study things that deal with uh, your craft, whether it be raising children or being a mechanic. You should study to become sharper mentally at whatever you do. I think this is very important. Brother Chad and I were talking about that, about the old, the old phrase, sharpen the saw. I have all this wood to cut. Yeah, well, sharpen your saw first, and it will go faster. He and I both were giving two different stories in our life where we watched somebody else with a little bit more wisdom. And we're like, what is he doing? He's sitting down with a chainsaw, and he's taking a hand file, and he's sharpening this old chainsaw. What's the point? Put a new blade on, or just, just push harder, right? You'll plow through it. If you don't sharpen your mental saw, you're really lacking in a lot of areas in life. And I think this is important for us to find ways to get sharper spiritually, physically, mentally. I believe the Lord would have us to number our days and figure out, do we have what it takes to get where we want to go? I think we should have family goals. We are all lacking somewhere in our family. Amen? Can we be honest, men? We're all lacking somewhere. There's something in our life, in our family, in our home that is lacking that we could do better. Perhaps you're dealing with a little bit of rebellion in a certain area. Is proper discipline being instituted? Because I will tell you, proper discipline is effective. Sometimes it takes time or maybe shifting gears. Maybe it's not always a swat or a correction in that regard. Maybe it's taking away privileges or finding ways to get through to the child, to get through to their heart so that they understand they've sinned against God and God has given them an authority. It's called parents, and you can't sin against your parents and get away with it. Not in God's standard, not in the family. Are you having family Bible time? Are you separating your time and saying this hour. This 20 minutes belongs to God. And we're going to sit together and we're going to learn together. And it, and it may not just have to be a, the reading of a chapter. Perhaps it's more of an animated story for the younger children or drawing them in and asking them questions and making sure that they're learning. It's important to have spiritual time in your family goals. I think it's also very important in the family to have, to have individual time. Time that you spend with each child individually. I try to make the effort when I have a short run to make in town or if I have to leave the house and come to the building up here, I'll take one of the older children with me just to spend that quality time 
to hold their hand in the truck while I'm driving, to talk to them about what's on their heart, to encourage them. And, you know, we need this in our spouses as well. And that means isolate. You know, hey, I'm tired. It's the end of the week. The kids are asleep. But we need time to talk as spouses. Perhaps this is something that's been lacking, but I just want to encourage you to set a goal for that. I think it's very important. I think it's very healthy if we do that. The Lord wants us to number our days and consider our time. We don't get a whole lot of it while, while we're on the earth. I hope you're making goals for your family and not just hoping for the best. We recently took a trip. We put in the coordinates. We had a goal. We had an agenda. We had a time we wanted to get there. And we started moving forward. Now, if I said to you, where is your family going? You said, you know, I don't know. That's a good question. How's that going to work out? Do you have a place and a purpose you want to see your family? Are you just hoping for the best? Or are you just kind of shooting from the hip? What's, what, where do you see the spiritual growth in your children and your family? Where are you going? I don't know. How's that going to work? Well, I hope it turns out well. Listen, we should have a vision. And it does start individually, parents, mom and dad. And that's going to work itself out. And you should teach your children to also, also number their days and consider their time. Money goals are also important. We won't talk about that really much. Uh, money goals are good. It, I mean, money is something we can count, but uh, it's important not to make sure that our budget is more important than our family. If your goals are just to get, well, it's, I got 40 days, and if I can just do this much more, work 20 more hours per week than I'm already working, then I'll hit that number I've always wanted to make this much per year. And if I can just invest all of my time in my budget for the next 40 days, I don't want to encourage you to do that. I would say give less for Christmas and give more time to your children. Money is important. That saying I give every now and then, money isn't everything, but it's right up there with oxygen. You kind of need it to live and survive and thrive. And yet God can give it to you as we need it. And it's important for us to not put money before our family, but not ignore it either. Go to Psalm 73, if you would, please. Go to Psalm 73. I want to ask you, what are you going to do with the last 40 days of 2021? Yet 40 days in 2021 is over. What would you like to be able to say that you did accomplish in this year? Write it down. Focus on it. Ask God about it. Pray about it. And get busy doing it. Are there people you'd like to see in church? Are there people in your family that you know have fallen away? People in your family perhaps that need to be saved? What kind of things did you not finish in 2020 that still haven't been finished in 2021? Have you considered these things? Or did you say, well, it's so far gone, I've forgotten now. It's, it's hopeless, it's pointless. On just about every deathbed confessional, I read it several years ago, I did a sermon on it, and I read a bunch of deathbed confessionals. And almost every person of every industry, of every walk of life, they had the same essential story, and that was, I wish I had worked less and spent more time with my family. This is not a sermon to say men be lazy. I think you guys know that. This is a sermon to say, get strict with your time and number your day, have a goal, set a purpose, change your habits, and see the vision that God has for your life. Psalm 73 is a very famous psalm. I know I say that about almost every passage. This one's famous, that one's famous. It's famous in my mind. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Psalm 73 for me is the answer to those that strive only for riches, that they miss the mark. This psalm is known as, it's one for the prosperity of the wicked. And I want to take a glimpse at the chapter to give us an idea of those that have the wrong goals and how sometimes it's discouraging to us that try to live for God. Let's look at verse number one, Psalm 73, verse one. Truly, God is good to Israel, even to such are of a clean heart. Again, it's all about the heart. It's not about the name, it's about the heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Now, what's the difference between, between jealousy and envy? One of you men, I want an answer. Yes, sir. Perfect. Envy is when you want something that somebody else has. Jealousy is when you have something you don't want to share. Right? 
we should be jealous over our wife. God is jealous over us. Here he's saying, I had almost slipped. I had well nigh slipped when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, when I saw the riches of the evil men in my time. I was envious. Now he starts off, his heart's not in the right place. He's saying, man, I wish I could live in the mansion on the hill. How come that guy has the easiest ride and he's got 100 employees and he doesn't have to lift a finger? Now, obviously, the grass is always greener on the other side, but you have no idea what's going on in that house. That man probably has no joy. They probably don't get any rest. There's probably all this strife and turmoil, and they watch their children destroy their lives. That's not part of this story, but just consider that. First of all, he's envious when he sees the prosperity of the wicked. Verse 4, for there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. He's saying it's not like they're getting locked up and thrown and died, right? Verse 5, they are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride compasseth them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. Right? So they get to do what they want. They have everything they want in this life. And it seems like pride just surrounds them. Like, like everywhere they go, they can say and do what they want and they get away with it. They have a bad attitude. They can be violent and get away with it. He's looking at this saying, why is this so? God is surely just, and how is it that this seems unequal on this earth? Verse 7, their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. What a statement. They have more than heart could wish. By the way, in the Bible, fatness is a, that's a good term. That means you're healthy. You're saying they've got everything they want. They can do whatever they want. They're healthy. Uh, they have more than heart could wish. That's like the guy that uh, not only does he have the mountain mansion on the hill, he's got like 17 garages in it. And, you know, he's got cars he's never even driven. He couldn't drive one every day of the month if he wanted to, right? Like, well, how do these people get to this point? Man, I want to be like that guy that has one of every famous car. No, you don't. No, you don't. Look what he says. They are corrupt. Verse 8. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They say big things and they're pushing people down low. They set their mouth against the heavens. Whoa, hold on a minute. Think about what he's saying here. Who's in heaven? Who's in heaven? God. God. When you set your mouth against heaven, you are speaking against God. These people have everything heart could wish, and they're so full of pride, they're speaking against God. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore, his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, how doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? They're saying, I can do whatever I want. I can go anywhere I want. I can have anything I want. I can enjoy my life. And who's going to tell me otherwise? There is no God in the heaven. Doth God know? Look what he says in verse 10. This is an atheist. Verse 11. How doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Is there, what is there up there that God knows? I don't believe in that. Now, I have to ask you guys a question. We went soul winning today. Who, do, who knocked on door number 59 at that apartment complex? Somebody did it. Who, do, who knocked door 59? Because that guy called me today. And he is an atheist. And I said, well, you know, God doesn't believe in atheists. He said, yeah, well, here I am. <laughs> okay. I tried to persuade and compel him. I tried, you know, hey, listen, this is, I said, listen, if you found a valuable treasure, wouldn't you share it with others? No, not necessarily. Yeah, I mean, if you're greedy, I, get, I guess I get that too. God doesn't care if you're an atheist. God knows that. Listen, all men are born with light. All men are born with the knowledge of God. You have to sear your conscience and reject God and reject God and reject God to the point where you can actually feel comfortable like there is no God or no judgment. That man knows for a fact the truth that he has an eternity to deal with. So do these people. But they say, how does God know? And how is their knowledge in the Most High? Look at verse 12. Behold, these are ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. These are the sons of the devil. The God of this world has the power to grant them wishes. And when their heart turns away from God and turns to riches, they can say, well, it's not because I'm turning to the devil. I'm just turning toward riches. Yeah, the devil wants you to believe that lie, doesn't he? This guy said, I, I told him, I said, there's three types of people in the world. 
We're born neutral. We're the, we're the sons of the world, the children of the world, and we choose to become the children of God. And we have God's Holy Spirit permanently indwelling us. And I said, if you're not careful, you will end up on the other side where you reject God so much that God rejects you and you become possessed with the devil. You're a child of the devil. He says, yeah, I reject both. I don't believe in either one. Isn't that the lie of the devil? To trick you and make you think there is no devil? God doesn't have to convince you that the devil's real. But if the devil can convince you that God won't judge you, or that all people go to heaven, he's successful. He has your soul. These are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. This sermon is about considering your time. Yet 40 days in 2021 is over. Don't make it all about riches or festivals. Look, I love getting together with family. We're going to have a Thanksgiving meal and a Christmas. We're going to do all that kind of stuff. Amen. And so much the more we should get closer and closer. But it's not just about that. It's about souls. It's about spiritual things. Set a goal now. Determine tomorrow morning when you get up what you're going to do different that you regret not doing the rest of this year. And you can have an impact on 2022 to come. Look at verse 13. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain. Now here you go. This is what happens to the Christian. When they see all that stuff, they feel discouraged. Like, well, why am I living right when look what they have? Look, verily I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say, I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of children. What's he saying? If I try to correct them, if I try to say, what are you people doing? He's talking about rebuking them. If I say, I will speak thus, I should offend against the generation of the children. I'm going to offend them if I try to correct them and tell them, don't just live for riches. There's more to life. Verse 16. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. He says, I don't understand why. They've got everything. I've got nothing. I'm hurting. They've got more than you could want. I try to tell them I'm going to get rebuked for rebuking them. Things just aren't just and aren't right in this earth. What's going on? When I think about this that I can't even speak of, this is painful for me to bear and meditate on. Verse 17, until, here's the key, until I went unto the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. I'm having all these problems. I see my rich neighbor. He's down on me and down on everybody, and I barely got anything, and I go to church, the sanctuary of God, and I hear the Word of God through the Spirit of God, and then I understood their end. I got all the riches of the world. I wouldn't trade it for nothing. I had a guy recently say this to me. This was in Costco. This is interestingly enough, and I told him I was going to borrow it. He said, think about this. If the devil, the world in Hollywood, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll sell your soul for a billion dollars, right? If the devil would buy your soul for a billion dollars, I wonder what the real value is. It's worth so much more. Can you fathom? Can you fathom the stacks of one dollar bills to make a billion dollars? That'd be something. Like what was that cartoon Scrooge, right? Or whatever, McDuck, right? <laughs> Swimming in the money. Wow, look at all this money. What are we going to do with it? We can have everything except your soul. For how long? Eternity. If the devil would buy your soul, if he could, for a billion dollars, what do you think your soul is really worth in God's eyes? What an amazing thought. When he goes, he says in verse 17, until I went unto the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. I wouldn't trade places with these billionaires for nothing in the world. No, sir. The lake of fire, fire and brimstone, torture, torment, the worm doesn't die. I don't think so. I don't want to go to hell. Thank God that he saves, and he only saves one way, and that's forever. And they reject that. And they want to live for themselves and live for prosperity. And listen, if you're a Christian, that doesn't mean that you're swearing to a life of poverty. God uses prosperous Christians in this world. He does. He does. But what if your calling and your purpose, your time is a season of poverty? Will you still glorify God? Or you, will you be disheartened when you see what they have and you don't? If so, remember what they don't have, and that's forgiveness of sins and eternity with God. Look at verse 18. We're almost done. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou cast them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation? As in a moment. 
They are utterly consumed with terrors. They had it all. They slip. They fall. They're destroyed. They're desolate in a moment. Verse 20. As a dream when one awaketh, so, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. Woo! Can you imagine God looking at somebody's face and saying, I despise your face? That's hard. God loves them. God died for them. He paid for their sins. And when they reject him and end up in hell, there's no pleasure there. Verse 21, this, thus my heart was grieved and I was pricked in my reins. So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. He says, I'm like a foolish animal. I am a brute beast. I'm not that smart. I got deceived by my eyes. I was judging unrighteously. I saw the vanity and the riches, and I said, ooh, if I had some of that, and then I realized, no, they're going to hell because they live for that. I'm living for God, and what he gives me on this earth is okay. I should be okay with food and raiment therewith to be content. Feed me with food that's convenient for me. Oh, thank God for what I've got. And thank him for what you don't have either. Think about it. Thank him for what you don't have. Look what he gives us. Verse 23. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast hold me by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. He's given us the comforter of the Holy Spirit. He's given us assurance of salvation. We have the counsel of the Word of God with us, and after this life, I will be with him. Verse 25. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. I don't want anything or anybody that would get in the way of me living for God. Verse 26, my flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. You say, what is my portion? What is my inheritance? What do I get to own on the earth? Your portion while you're here is God. He is with you. He will guide you. He will comfort you. And God is the strength of your heart. Think about that. Look what it says. God is the strength of your heart. When your heart feels weak, when you're overwhelmed, when you're not sure what to do, God is the strength of your heart. I say all this to remind you the point of this sermon. Yet 40 days and 2021 is over. I want to encourage you to start now, start tomorrow, on focusing on the end of this year and a transition, a smooth transition into next year. Better next year because you started now, not waiting to the end of the year. I would encourage you to be here for the last two sermons of the year. On the last Sunday, I'm preaching the vision I have for 2022 as a church. We're preaching through Corinthians and we will be having the Lord's Supper as we hit that chapter on the last Wednesday of the year. I would encourage you to come and examine yourself and prepare your hearts and to seek the Lord in 2022. Verse 27, and we're done. Look at this. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a-whoring from thee. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord that I may declare all thy works. God has a purpose for us. Let's draw near to Him. Let's get close to Him through His Word and through prayer. Let's declare His works. Let's preach the gospel. Let's train the children. Let's tell our family that there's something better than just the prosperity of the wicked in this world. It's our job to find this vision. It's your personal responsibility to change your time, to change your opinion about what matters in life, and let's start living for God now. There's yet 40 days left in this year. Let's not waste a one. Let's grab a hold of each one for the Lord. Let's do it. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for the vision that you give us from your word. Lord, I pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you would encourage us to find a purpose for the rest of this year and for next year. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.